Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, welcome. We're glad to have you with us this evening. If you haven't already done so, the poll question uh, will have come up on your screen. You can answer that and we'll check on the results in a couple of minutes. I want to thank you all for attending today's webinar. If we haven't met yet, my name is Jessica Holvik and Chris, you're muted right now. You'll have to, there we go. Yeah, I'm Chris Butchart. I'm Jessica's partner and I'm very close to retirement as you can probably tell. Uh, so I'm going to totally relate to these, this topic today. Chris and I are financial planners. So um, Marianne, do you mind getting the presentation started there? Be fine. With Asante Capital Management. Um, and if you look to the next slide there, Marianne, we've got some photos from our branch. So you can see Chris and I on the left there and our team on the right. You may notice there are a lot of women on our team. So we're really excited to be doing this webinar that is specifically about some of the unique issues that women face in retirement. Our job as financial planners is to understand the vision our clients have for their life and then help them organize the financial aspects of their life so that they can make that vision happen. We also recognize though, that there's a lot more to living a fulfilling and satisfying life than just having enough money in the bank. Today, we wanted to talk about the non-financial aspects of retirement life. Many of us think of retirement as a number, whether that's an age or a specific dollar amount, a number that we need to reach to obtain the freedom to choose a life without work commitments. But most people don't think to plan for what they really want from the next 25 to 30 years. Like any important life transition, planning for this retirement journey is really important. People will often spend weeks planning a one week vacation, but put no thought at all into their post-career life. A successful retirement requires planning for your emotional, mental, and physical health, not just your financial health. That's why Chris and I have partnered with the Next Chapter Lifestyle Advisors to better help our clients plan for all aspects of their retirement. Today, we're gonna to talk specifically about some unique non-financial issues that women deal with in retirement. Being aware of possible problems and pitfalls, as well as potential opportunities, prepares you to deal with them more effectively. Today, I'm pleased to have with us one of industry, the industry's leading authorities on comprehensive retirement planning from Next Chapter Lifestyle Advisors, Marianne Osher. Thanks, Jessica. It's delightful to be here, and I sincerely applaud the fact I see from our poll that over 60% of you guys are preparing to retire, and this couldn't be a better topic for you right now as you're thinking about what you, how you want this time of your life to unfold. So there is a, is a story about an old, uh, an old Cherokee that, that fulfills this, that makes this idea come alive, that retirement is filled with both challenges and opportunities. So the old Cherokee was teaching his granddaughter some life lessons. And he said, a fight is going on inside of me. It's a terrible fight. And it's between two wolves. One is evil. He has anger and resentment and fear and regret and sorrow. Continue that there's another one. The other one is a good wolf. And he is joy and peace and happiness and kindness and serenity. And that same fight is going on inside of you and inside of every other person too. The young girl thought about that for a moment and then said, Grandfather, which wolf will win? And he said, the one that you feed. And so it is my sincere hope today 
that we are, because we are going to be talking about both the challenges and opportunities that you may face as you move into retirement, that you will walk away inspired to feed the opportunities. Just to can I just yes. pause there for one second? Absolutely. I forgot to let people know that there will be a Q&A time at the end. So if you have questions along the way, Marianne's going to talk about a lot of things with us, I'm sure, and our brains are going to be exploding. If you have questions, <laughs> there's a Q&A feature. That if you scroll down or sort of mouse over the bottom of your screen, you should have a number of options that come up. One of them is Q&A. You can put your questions in there and at the end during the Q&A time, we will um, answer those questions. So anytime throughout, go ahead and throw your questions in there. Okay. Sorry, Marianne, go ahead. No problem. And you would also also probably received a, um, a workbook uh, from Jessica and her team. And we encourage you after this time together to, to look at that workbook because in it we have posed some questions to provoke your thinking as you prepare for retirement. And we'll mention those as we go through the presentation today. So we are going to talk about the issues that people face as they move from their career into retirement. Some of the differences between how that works for men and how it works for women. And then there's that elephant in the room, aging, and there are definitely some differences there, but some important things for you to think about as you're preparing for this time. The, 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 the syndrome of empty nest, which I'm sure several of you who have children are familiar with, the burdens and benefits of caregiving, flying solo, and lastly, how you can thrive in retirement. In 1990, some research was done by Psychology and Aging that asked people about whether they had difficulty as they moved from their career into retirement. And about a third of them said, yes, that they did have difficulty. Well, a similar study was done 25 years later and that same question was asked again, but that no, the number now is, was almost 70%, it over doubled in the last 25 years. And that was pre-COVID. And I'm willing to tell you from my, from my own experience that I'm sure that that number has, has, rate, has increased even more. So why is that happening? Well, for one reason, longevity has increased the amount of time that we're going to be spending in this chapter of, of our life. For some of us, this chapter is going to be longer than our career chapter was. And, and it's very different than it was from, for generations that came before us. And so the question now becomes, how am I gonna fill up these 25 or 30 years that lie ahead of me? And in addition, we as baby boomers have expectations that, ex that are different from generations that preceded us. I mean, heck, we have been changing the way, the way that we've looked at the world since we were teenagers. And it certainly is not stopping now. There's many evidences, much evidence of the ways that, that, is, that retirement itself is changing today as we move through that phase. And as a result, there are no roadmaps and very few ro role models in order to inspire us. So we're figuring it out as we go along. And for each of us, that road is a little bit different. And then, of course, COVID disrupted everything by making us much more afraid of what boredom could look like. Now, so another reason why people are having so much difficulty um, adjusting to this new stage of their life is because as you, when you invest so much time and effort in your career or whatever it was you did for that period of your life, it, that, that, that mantle becomes part of how you see yourself, part of our, your identity. And when you take that mantle off and leave it behind, many people struggle with, who am I now? And that's an important question to be answered as you, as you start your journey into retirement. The same thing is true for purpose, because when, you, when what you do helps other people in some way, whether it's other people in a company, whether it's your community, whether it's clients, whatever it is that your work did to make the, the world a better place, it's gone. And we as human beings have a strong need to feel that we matter. And so that is an important thing to think about as you begin to, to design what you want this time of your life to look like. What's gonna make you feel like you matter? What's your purpose going to be now? 
you lose that sense of structure. And while most of us absolutely celebrate not having to listen to an alarm clock anymore and being, and being able to decide what you want your days to look like, as opposed to somebody else filling that in for you, many times people think they don't want a structure. And the reality is we as humans also have a need to do that. And when you don't have a structure, many people feel like they're drifting and lost because at the end of the day, they say, well, you know, okay, my day's over, but I didn't really accomplish anything today. I feel like I wasted my time. So it's creating a structure that is good for you is important. You will also lose some of your social connections, the people that you worked with, that you enjoyed spending time with. But sadly, even though you have the best intentions to stay in touch with them, when you lose that commonality of whatever it is that you did for a living, often those friendships just seem to fade away. And then you also lose that sense of accomplishment when a project is completed or you've done something that, that is benefiting another person. And sadly, a reality of this time of your life is the increase of gray divorce. And the gray divorce is people over 50 who are divorcing. Now, I wanna tell you that that is often caused by all of the things that change as you move out of your career into this new lifestyle. But it doesn't have to be that way. I clearly, in the, in the 12 years I've been doing this, have worked with a number of couples that came to me in the beginning because they said that their, their, life, their relationship used to be great. Now all they do is bicker and fight. And as soon as we worked through it, their relationship got even better than it had been before. So even though these, these are challenges that you may face, they do not have to define that next chapter of your life at all. But when those challenges are not addressed, when you don't find ways to replace the things that were important to you from your work life and don't deal with, it, with all of the things that are changing, then some pain shows up. And it can show up in terms of boredom, how you fill up your days, a feeling you're relevant because you've lost that sense of purpose and you no longer feel like you're mattering. You feel disconnected and you've lost part of your, your network and maybe you're not doing something to replace that. And sadly, way too many people fall into depression as a result of not addressing these pain points. And so I tell you that because I want you to be aware that if these things come up, it doesn't mean that it has that your life is over or that it, it's all gonna be bad from there on. It just means that there's something that you need to look at and address. Your mindset as you move into this time of your life is so important. And that's the story about the Cherokee teaching his granddaughter um, about feeding the good as opposed to the evil, feeding the opportunities as opposed to the challenges is part of all of this. Because when your mindset says, I'm looking at this time of your life as the end of the road, the best is over and it's all downhill from here, what do you think happens? That's the kind of picture you see, and those are the kinds of things that show up in your life. Another mindset that many people have is that this is going to be a 30-year vacation, and I am simply going to love to play, play golf every day for the next 30 years. I'm going to love to do whatever it was that you love to do. But the reality is, yes, in the beginning, it is a wonderful time, and it feels like a fantastic vacation. But we know from research that that honeymoon period only lasts somewhere between six to 18 months. And then the normal way of living begins to, to, to show up and, the, and the, the glitter of the newness wears off. And so if you don't have a realistic view that this is more, much more than just a vacation, certainly it's a time to, to, do much, to engage in much more leisure than you had before, but there's more to it. And so if you have that mindset that this time that's ahead of you is filled with unlimited possibilities of all the things that you can learn and grow and expand your horizons. And you know that it can be filled with exciting and stimulating things. That's how your life will unfold. So your mindset is critical. Let's look now at some of the differences between men and women as they move into retirement. The first one is a very sad reality and that is the often financial inequality between men and women. Because if we, although we were making progress and although things are getting better, 
typically women still earn less money over their career. And as for the reasons that we know, the inequality in job opportunity, employment opportunities, and pay. I mean, even at the end of my career, as, as much as I was valued for the work that I did, I, I came to learn um, through a, a way I wasn't supposed to, that I still was significantly underpaid from some of my male counterparts. And it's just unfortunately something that we're still working on changing. But it impacts how much money you have now as you move into this time of your life. Also, for, for women, it is not uncommon to spend eight to 10 years either raising your children and being out of the workplace or moving into caregiving for a significant person in your family. And unfortunately, that means that you'll have less money to deal with when, because we are living longer and you face additional financial challenges. But the good news about this is that women in general are now asking to have the kinds of conversations with, with um, Jessica and Christine about this kind of issue and what, kinds, what you can do in terms of planning for this time of your life. So be sure to reach out and, make sure, and have that conversation. Another difference between men and women is the question of, is it easier for women to adjust to this time of your life? And that is an assumption. And the truth of the matter is, it really depends. It depends on the type of job that they are leaving. Whether it's a man or a woman, if you're leaving a job that is psychologically fulfilling to you, it is much harder to let go of it and therefore harder to, to make the, to all the changes that are necessary in this time of your life. And when you, if your job is not psychologically fulfilling, most of the time you're just so glad to be rid of it and you're glad to move on. And so it's not as difficult. So, so fulfilling um, job op careers are often harder to leave behind. Also, whether or not it was a woman's choice to leave. Now, sometimes women are forced to, to, uh, to take a leave of, you know, to change their career, shorten their career because of the need for caregiving. And, and that is a sad reality. Or of course, there's corporate downsizing and all the other things that sometimes force people into retirement. So if it's not your choice for whatever the reason is, that will make it more difficult to, 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 to make the adjustment. The good news is that women tend to have higher quality of social skills than men do. And so if your social skills are good, that will work in your favor as you make the adjustment to life after, after your work. The, set, the third difference is the way that men and women navigate this transition. You know, when any big change in your life happens, you go through the internal process of transitioning from what you knew in your life was to what is still a little bit unknown. And the challenge of letting go of what you used to love about what you did is difficult. It's difficult for both men and women, but women tend to, to deal with that a little bit um, more easily than men because they typically also have other priorities in, in their life else that are outside of work. And that means that they're, it's easier to move, to move to something that men frequently don't have that same feeling. Women also, we know from research, um, tend to get more satisfaction from leisure activities. And the hypothesis there is that because our social skills tend to be better, we truly enjoy the social aspect of our leisure activities. And so therefore, it, that helps that, that transition because we enjoy those leisure activities even more than men do. And we often have better developed social lives than men do. Another difference that women face for, that men do not is adjusting to their spouse 24 seven. And while this issue, this syndrome called um, retired husband syndrome sounds sexist, I don't mean it to be. I can just tell you that from research that doesn't happen with women the same way that it happens with men. And what that typically means is, especially men who have had um, the responsibility for supervising others or being in control and in command of, of, of an organization or a department or what a team, they tend to have a more difficult time moving into retirement and not interfering with whatever their wife's domain is. And a very good example of that is one of my clients came in for, um, for a session, and this was when I lived in Naples, Florida, 
And she, she sat down in a big huff and she said, I can't believe this happened. I went out for lunch with my girlfriends yesterday. And when I came home, he had alphabetized my spices and I can't find anything now. Now, he, her husband thought she, he was helping her by making it more convenient and easier to find them, not recognizing that she knew where they were and didn't really want to look at them alphabetically. And so it's little things like that when a man that sometimes doesn't have other things to do because their social skills and their, their social network is not as broad, they tend to interfere in, the, you know, in their wife's domain and recognize that that may happen. The good news is it typically doesn't last that long, especially when you say, hey, thanks very much, but I'd rather you put your skills to some other use and other than interfering with the way I have my kitchen organized. But also as, as a man adjusts more to this time of their life and develops their own social network, that syndrome tends to go away. But women also tend to feel that their relationship has improved as a result of retirement. And therefore, that they feel a closer bond to their, to their spouse and be, being able to, tr to spend more time together that they, that they couldn't before. But no matter whether either of those are, whatever's going on for you, I encourage you please to not make assumptions about what your, this time of your life is going to be. I can't tell you how many people that I've, that I've worked with over the years who came to see me because their relationship was struggling only to find out that the real problem was that they had made different assumptions about what this time of their life was going to be like because they didn't talk about the details. Oh, sure, they talked about their bucket list and the trips they were going to take, but they didn't talk about the everyday things. And just a really quick story about that. One woman, one couple came in and he was talking about how, you know, it had been, they'd done, uh, taken all these great trips and everything was just wonderful. And she wasn't saying anything. And you could just see by her body language, she was getting angrier and angrier. <clears throat> and all of a sudden she burst out and said, why do I always have to do the laundry? And he looked at her like she was crazy. He had no idea what she was talking about. And the problem was, and then she burned, she said, but I'm retired too. And see, he had assumed that she liked doing the laundry and she liked doing the grocery shopping. And so she was going to continue to do it. She assumed that he was going to have more time and he would pitch in with some of those things so they could have more time to do fun things or other things that they wanted to do. She dropped some hints. He didn't pick up on the hints. Now, she didn't express it clearly, and he didn't ask because they'd never talked about even the littlest thing, like how they were going to share activities. So don't make assumptions. Make sure that you have those conversations about the little things as well as the big things in your life, in your, in your new life. The next is that elephant in the room, aging. And we talked about your mindset about retiring and how you your mindset about this time of your life but your mindset about aging is equally as important so is yours the one that is you're dreading it and you you, you look at every day as you're you you're you're going downhill or are you looking at it as filled with opportunities and possibilities because you see aging is inevitable being old is a choice and so let me share with you some of the positive things that are unfolding for us women. Research supports this now. That as we are moving into this time of our life, women tend, their, women's attitudes about aging are improving. And that's a very positive thing. Many of us now believe that 70 is the new 50. I mean, we feel at 70 is like, like we used to feel at 50. We're just not aging as rapidly as people used to in my mother's and grandmother's generation. They are also looking at this as a liberating phase of their life. They're now free to do more of the things that they want to do, not be tied as, as tied down to their responsibilities. And they see a, a, and this as an opportunity to reach new goals, to do new things, to accomplish more things. And more men actually could benefit by having more of that attitude because many men do not. And they also believe that aging offers an opportunity to focus on themselves after years of focusing on others. So those positive attitudes towards aging help to, to make this time of your life not feel like you're going downhill, but in fact, exhilarated and expanding. And the truth of the matter is, we know that this concept of middle age is expanding. We know from research 
that people in their 70s and 80s are much more capable of um, sustaining physical activity, that their minds are sharper, that they are engaged in more things. And so therefore, part of that mindset is how you look at the labels that we put on these times of our life. So I particularly like Helen Harkness's definition of the life stages um, that we all are familiar with. Young adulthood is typically 20 to 40, and that hasn't really changed in Helen's de definition. But she says something important. She talks about two halves of middle life, that the first half is 40 to 60, and the old view was by 60 you were old. Well, that isn't true anymore. Now you enter the second half of middle age, and it's not until you're 80 or older that you're approaching where you're approaching being old, and then you're really not elderly until you're in your 90s or even older. So that mindset helps you to see that, okay, I'm 76 right now. That doesn't mean I'm old. I'm still in my middle age. And that, that attitude allows you to be open to see some of the possibility. Here are just a couple of, of, of examples that I particularly love. Nola Okus, who started, um, she always wanted to go to school, to college, but she, in her life, it wasn't possible. And when her husband died, she decided to go to college. Now, it took her 30 years to get there, but she graduated at age 95 with her granddaughter, and she even lived in the dorm for a little while. Mary Armstrong believe, celebrated her 90th birthday by skydiving. I'm not sure I'm going to do that, but she did. But my favorite one is biker chick, um, Tess. And she is, she, she went at her 102nd birthday, she was surrounded by her family and friends. And she, somebody said, what do you really want to do? And she at 102 said, I've always wanted to ride a motorcycle. And so her family organized the local Harley Davidson um, dealer to bring over a motorcycle. And, and that day, Tess was so excited. She put her helmet on and her younger sister, at, who was only 95, rode in the sidecar. Now, Bess didn't drive the motorcycle, she, but she rode behind the man who did ride it. And when she came roaring back into the parking lot, she said, wow, that was the most exhilarating thing I've ever done in my life. So your mindset says, if you think I'm 102 and I can't ride a motorcycle, guess what you're gonna be giving up? So don't let your mindset de declare what you can and cannot choose to do because it defines what is possible for you. And moving on to empty nest syndrome. Now, empty nest syndrome is, we all know what it is, the phenomenon of the last child leaving. And it's often very bittersweet. And it's, we know true from research that it is usually harder for women to go through this than men. And when empty nest syndrome also co corresponds with that time of leaving whatever you did um, for your career, it's kind of a double whammy. So it's bittersweet because while you clearly are eager for your child to, 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 to fly and, and establish themselves as an adult, you miss them. You miss them being around. You miss them being in the household. And it, as I just said, it does affect men too, not, not as significantly as women. And often one of the th effects of empty nest syndrome is, is when you feel that your purpose was raising your children and there's no, there are no more children around to, um, to include in your planning, um, you feel like you've lost your sense of purpose. And so this is your opportunity to find a new sense of purpose. So how can you cope with an empty nest? It, but this is, your, this is your opportunity to, dis, to rediscover who you are apart from your kids. Sometimes we fight the timing of it. So whether it's you're ready for it or not, accept it because it's your child's decision. It's your opportunity to reconnect with your partner. So often couples put their relationships sort of on the side to focus on their children. And that means that um, they, they have not invested over those years in, in nourishing their relationship. So it's an opportunity to reconnect and make your relationship even better. Remember why you fell in love with each other. And it's an opportunity to get to know your children as adults. Hey. Exercise regularly often helps all of us all the time and invest in yourself. And of course, laughing helps everybody. The other side of empty nest is boomerang children when they come back to, to, they come back to home after you thought they've already launched. 
And we know now that over half of young people are living with one or both parents, which is higher than it was right after the, the Great Depression. But the reasons make sense. The reasons are we know that young people today are delaying marriage. And as a result, they also, that means delaying two income households. They're even delaying the concept of living together until they get married. So fewer non-married people are living together, which means again, there's not two people to income to pay for the cost of those high rents and you know, paying off that student debt. And often, you know, we know that it's sometimes hard to get the kinds of jobs that are good paying. The issue too is that this situation can last for a couple of months or a couple of years. And being clear about how long that's going to be is one of the, the things that you need to have a conversation about. There's also a good side to it and a bad side to it. I mean, the good side is it's an opportunity for your child to save money and to pay off some of those debts that they have, student loans and so forth. But the bad side is it can also have a negative impact on their self-esteem, you know, failure to launch. I couldn't make it on my own. I had to come back. The bad also is it's an opportunity for conflict because um, there's, there are often issues around privacy and independence that can cause conflict. So when you're aware of that and you look for that possibility, you're far more likely to avoid it, to not let it happen. So some tips for making it a positive experience, set clear expectations. This is what I meant before, but talk about what the plan is for how long your, ch your child is going to be home. So you both have an, an opportunity of what the expectations are. And your adult child should participate, contribute to the household in some way, whether it's contributing to groceries, whether it's contributing to cooking or cleaning or participating in family events, whatever it is that's important to you that they, you feel that they're making a contribution. And when you lay out that timeline that after you have expectations, not only about what their involvement is going to be, but how long they're going to be there, at least you have an idea when the end of the tunnel is going to arrive. And it's also sometimes easy for both um, young adults to fall back into old habits and, and parents to fall back into parenting habits that may no longer be appropriate for um, now grown children. So just look for those, those experiences. And when you talk about them and um, navigate through them, it can be a very positive experience for everybody. And then there are burdens and benefits of caregiving. We know that providing essential care for kids or aging parents or other adults often falls mostly on women. And we know that 65% of older adults with long-term care needs rely on family and friends for that assistance. And so that, that increases the likelihood that you may be faced with this issue of are you are going to be a caregiver or how often, how much are you going, how much of your time are you going to invest in it? And the roles can be anything from hands-on caregiving to surrogate decision makers or advocates. So, so just in recognize that for many of us, that is sometimes a challenge that falls more heavily on women than men in, in retirement. And there are burdens for sure. It impacts careers. So sometimes women are required to either take take a leave of absence or retire earlier than they intended to, and which creates um, some of the psychological resentment that, and, and difficulty adjusting to this time of your life, which therefore impacts finances. If, you, if your career is interrupted or cut short, you have less money that you can save. It can in, impact relationships by creating friction about the amount of time that you have to spend. And we know also it can affect the health of the caregiver because they're more likely to have their own chronic health issues. Um, it, women who are caregivers are more likely to have those chronic conditions than women who are not required or responsible for caregiving. So manage your health is part of it. But there are benefits, even with the, the difficulties that caregiving can bring to you, providing that care to families or friends may, deter, may be the, re, the, the thing that they need in order to stay in their home. And it may be giving you more purpose in your life. And we know from research that women who are caregivers feel like they have more of a sense of purpose than women who are not caregivers. 
And it may be an opportunity if you are already close to somebody that it brings you closer. Or maybe if you've kind of drifted apart, it's an opportunity to resolve that. Besides, you might get a taste of what you yourself might need someday. So those are some benefits that truly do result from that wonderful um, commitment to helping someone when they need that caregiving. And fly, flying solo is often an issue that women face more often than men, whether it's certainly because of divorce or widowhood, widowhood in particular, but solo, solo agers are also people who don't have children and lifelong singles who have um, simply been, been single for all of their life. But there are some myths to overcome about that because the life of a, of a single woman or a man for that, that, for that point is different than this old stereotype that it's, you must be lonely and miserable. But the truth of the matter is, we have found through research, there's actually very little difference between singles or people who are in relationship in terms of whether they are lonely and miserable. And that's because, you know, you can't marry someone because you are afraid of being alone or because you, you just, you, you simply want companionship. You have to, they have to add another dimension to your life or you have not fixed the loneliness or unhappiness that that relationship is, is not going to fix for you. And there's also a myth that single people are not very healthy. They don't eat properly is one of the myths. But the truth of the matter is that we, that there is no difference. And in fact, we find, we have found that the eating habits of single people sometimes are better than people in a relationship. So that myth is destroyed. And I'm, I actually skipped that happier piece. The happier piece is right now that we know that, that whether you're married or not married, your sense of happiness is about the same. There's no difference because you can't look to another person to make you happy. It is something that comes from your inside and not just because you're with another person. And there are some ways that solo women actually do better than either non-solo women or, or men. And one is they're more, more social. We know that um, this is consistent with the study that's 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 referenced in this article that I've referenced at the bottom of the page, but also there are several other studies that have said that we know that single people take make more effort in keeping in touch with siblings and friends and you know just other people. They make more of an effort to do that than married people do. For whatever reason, they tend to be more highly educated. Now I can't tell you what the correlation there is, but we know that it's true. They tend to adapt to using the, um, the internet to stay in touch. So they tend to be more tech savvy and are less lonely in old age because they've learned how to fill their life with, with the things that make them happy. And we can't overestimate the importance of social ties. I mean, it's true regardless of whether you're flying solo or not. And this is based particularly on a study that I've referenced here, the Harvard Study of Adult Development, which has been going on for 85 years. Harvard has been studying people's lives and what makes them healthy and what makes them happy. And the major finding is that while exercise and diet are, are definitely important, that social, your, the strength of your social connections is even more important than whether you exercise or whether you smoke or whether you, you, know, you eat, eat properly. So mind your social connections for sure. And that's what they, they have said that it is truly, the Harvard study has said that it really is truly the key to healthy aging. And it's especially important for solo agers. So what are some of the issues that women face? And one of the big ones is the decision to live alone or not live alone. And here are some of the considerations at, as you, if you're a, if it's a solo woman, that you should make. Is it important for you to have your privacy or connectedness? Do you want it to, to be living with perhaps a roommate that you can share meals with? Which, is, which one is more important to you? Do you value independence or security? That would, that would influence whether you stay living in a single family home, for example, or moved to a community where um, you're in a perhaps a condo situation where there's more security involved. Um, do you want to be in a place that is age restricted, 50 and over, or 
do you like the diversity of listening to ki- children sp- splash in the swimming pool or or running down the street playing games? Up to you, what, which, what's important to you? But the really key one I think is how strong is your social network? Because if you choose to live alone, you're less likely to, to encounter people just on a regular daily basis. And therefore your social network needs to be particularly strong. Now, what about traveling alone? What are some of the considerations there? One of the things that's happening as we are all becoming more comfortable with the concept of being alone, um, whether it's by choice or not by choice, is that traveling, is, solo traveling is starting to grow. And as a result, there are more opportunities for women to find just small group tours that are women only. And there's now a website that's actually a very robust website called solotravelerworld.com which gives you lots of opportunities, both tips, but also opportunities for um, traveling as, as a solo person. And in, a, in that situation, no matter how you're traveling, whether you're in a group or not in a group, you're only as long as you want to be. I mean, you can make friends with people that you meet along the way as well. And I am told that the first trip is the hardest that the first one that you take alone. And there's also this stigma maybe that exists with traveling alone. There isn't one when I was traveling for business, I never thought twice about it. But if I thought about traveling alone for pleasure now, I would think twice about it and I don't know why. So examine what your own mindset is about things that might be holding you back. Another issue is planning and I'm sure that that Jessica and Chris have talked to you about some of these issues. But the first, first one that they may not have is emotional support. And having a source for emotional support, not just somebody to help you go to the grocery store if you need to have need to get a ride, but who's there, who's there to help you with the ups and the downs of the things that happen in your life? But equal, equally important is have you thought about legal representation and who's going to help you if you're not capable of making decisions? Who's going to support you as you make your financial decisions and who will make those decisions if you don't have the capability? Who's going to go with you to the doctor when you've got a, a, you know, a, a particular problem that you don't want to have to necessarily face alone? And thinking those things through ahead of time when that's not an issue is the right time to have those kinds of conversations. And lastly, what does it take to thrive in retirement? Well, we know that Participation in activities is extremely important because it fosters your sense of self-worth. So when you're in, when you're engaged with other people, you feel good about yourself. Also, that sense of satisfaction is knowing that you have control over every over events and decisions. Now, you may not have control over how the event unfolds. That we usually don't, but you do have control over how you look at it and how you choose to respond to it. And when people forget that they have, they control their reaction or response to a situation, they tend to feel like a victim and life is doing this to me. But we, we all do control how we want to see whatever it is that's unfolding. And we also have control over the decisions that we make. You don't have to say, you know, I, I don't have control over my decisions because you do. And this, this can, this, when you have emotional support, you are far more likely to feel like your life is satisfying than if you don't have that kind of emotional support. And it can be friends, it can be family, it can be wherever it is that you choose to turn. And some of the things that you can do that will help you to really thrive, surround yourself with things that you love. I mean, it's, why not? Do the things that, are, that, make, that make you happy. Be engaged in life. Don't just sit on the couch and watch it parade past you. Be engaged. You know, take, take initiative to join organizations or to, to attend events or to do the kinds of things that you enjoy doing. And nurturing your social ties is key, as a Harvard business, as a Harvard School of uh, Study said that I quoted a minute ago, that those are such an important key to how well you age and therefore how you thrive in, in this retirement. So do things that you enjoy and pamper yourself. Why not? And one of the ways that you can take care of yourself is by making sure that you have a retirement lifestyle plan. It's really that key. 
and it's key to thriving. And your retirement lifestyle plan is that process of creating a vision and an action plan for your life. Not just thinking it's going to unfold naturally, because quite honestly, then you're not determining what kinds of things you want in your life. Many people, I mean, I've said, what, what, are your, what are your plans for retirement? And they'll tell me, you know, the trips they're going to take and the closets they're going to clean and the books they're going to read. But those are bucket list items. They're not a plan. And often when people have that view that it's going to be a 30-year vacation, they think that the only part of their life that they have to plan is leisure. And leisure is important. Don't get me wrong. It's extremely important. You have more time to enjoy it. But it's only one of the areas of your life. And so this is your opportunity to address how you want your life to unfold. And it has to include activities that stimulate you and motivate you and engage you in life. Starting with your vision, it has to be clear. You know, when many people have that unclear vision of a 30 year vacation and it's just gonna unfold, well, that's not very realistic. And so having a more realistic view and a clear vision of what you want to be like is going to ensure that it's going to unfold the way that you want to. And it needs to be balanced. As I said, it's not all leisure. Um, certainly that can be a big component, but there's more to it. And it has to be an exciting vision. You have to be excited about getting up in the morning. And we suggest that you use your happiness portfolio as your way to create your retirement lifestyle plan. And uh, Jessica and, and Christine can help you with it. They have access to your happiness portfolio workbook, which will guide you through answering, you have, creating that vision and an action plan for how you want to spend that valuable asset of your time in each of the eight areas of your life. Your primary relationship. I mean, if you, you, if you are a solo ager, that relationship may be a child or it may be a very close friend. Um, or if you're in a relationship, it certainly could be, which should be your, pri your primary relationship. What are you going to do to nurture that, whatever that relationship is? How are you going to continue to it for it to grow and thrive? How do you want to give back? Is it in time or is it in money? Or in what way do you want to do that? How much of your time do you want to enjoy in, the, in leisure activities? And what kind of leisure activities do you want? Are you just going to respond to the ones that come, that come across from in, invitations? Or are you going to create some of your own invitations to other people? What are you going to do to continue to grow as a human being? Do you or do you not want professional to be part of this time of your life? You know, retirement no longer means not working. There are over 50% of those of us who are, quote, retired, who are still working because we love what we're doing. And there are lots of reasons to, to include that. Some, and some of it is social connections. What are you going to do for your health and wellness? I mean, purposely do for your health and wellness. Research tells us that when you ask people what they're going to do when they retire, one of the main things that they say is, I'm going to increase my exercise um, program and I'm going to eat better. Well, the sadness is that, it, that six months later, only about 50% of those people have actually done anything about it. And part of the value of your happiness portfolio is when you write down your vision and you write down the actions you're going to take for help for maintaining your health and wellness, you're far more likely to actually do it. How do you want, how do you want to spend time with your family and friends? Are there some people in your life right now that are actually draining you and you want to spend less time? Or since you're walking away from, from a profession, do you want to expand your network? of friends by joining some organizations where you're likely to meet like-minded like people doing things that you enjoy doing? And what specifically are you going to do to nurture your emotional and spiritual well-being? That's what your happiness portfolio is, your plan for being engaged in life for the next 25 or 30 years. And your happiness portfolio is not a one and done situation. My husband and I update ours, you know, the new year, every January 1st, every year, we take a look at what we're doing and what we want to change in terms of our life so that we're consciously making sure that we're doing what we want to do. Now, there are a couple of ways to build your happiness portfolio. You can do it yourself. And as I mentioned, Jessica and, and Chris have the workbook that you can use. Also, both my partner and I have books that might be helpful. Susan has written The Nine Steps to a Rich Life Retirement, 
live well, give back, and leave a legacy, which helps you with that mindset issue for sure. And my book is called Your Happiness Portfolio Retirement. It's not about the money. I mean, retirement's about the money, but Jessica and Chris are helping you with that. The book isn't about the money. It's simply about the non-financial areas of your life. Other people feel more comfortable taking you with a little bit more help and they like to take workshops. Many of the, the adult learning, the lifelong learning centers in most cities these days, usually, is, usually they're affiliated with a college or university or you know, community college, have courses that help you to think through this time of your life. And then there's also um, retirement consulting, which is, I've talked about some of the people that I've helped over, over the years, and that's working with someone who is a specialist in helping you think through the issues of each of those areas of your life and what you really want them to be like. Whichever way you choose, it's great. Just make sure that you consciously make a, make a plan to build your happiness portfolio. And we're going to close with um, one of my favorite quotes of Eleanor Roosevelt. She said, the purpose of life is to live it, to taste experience to the utmost, to reach out eagerly and without fear for newer and richer experience. And that's exactly what this next chapter of your life can be like. So to recap, women face some of the same challenges men do, plus a little bit more um, with empty nest syndrome, the responsibility of caregiving, and are more likely to have to fly solo. But women also have very strong assets to deal with with these challenges, strong social skills, established social networks, and women tend to be more resilient, especially around aging. And so I hope that we have inspired you to feed the opportunities that, that are before you as you start this next chapter of your life. Back to the workbook, when you when you go through some of the exercises there, I particularly ask you to think about what you've learned from what we've, our time together today. And what one action do you wanna take? What are you going to do as you move forward, as you move into this new time of your life? And with that, Jessica, Chris, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thanks, Marianne. So we will open up to questions. We've had a couple of questions come in already. And if you've got something mulling around in your head there, make sure you put it into the Q&A so we can pose them to Marianne and pull out all her great wisdom on this. <laughs> we've got her. So first question is, can you talk about the pros and cons of keeping a routine? Yes. Um Having a sense of uh, at least a loose routine helps you to do some of the things that you either don't want to do necessarily, or mm, you know might be a little bit reluctant. For, for example, joining a new organization. Um, so having some kind of a routine where you say, "Okay, I'm going to do the laundry now, and I'm going to do the grocery shopping now, and that's going to free me up so that I have time to do the other things" is a positive thing. Now, many people say to say, I just want to fly by the seat of my pants. Well, I would suggest that that is to some degree a good thing, but without a routine and you say that I'm just going to fly by the seat of my pants every single day, you're, un you're unlikely to actually address some of the things that, and make sure that they're in your life that are going to make you feel like you have a sense of purpose, that are going to make you feel like you're connected in, in a special way. So having flexibility is great, but I would suggest that even a loose routine is will help you to make sure that you don't feel like you're just drifting willy nilly through this time of your life. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, can you comment to managing the demands that can fall on us when we aren't working anymore? For example, babysitting the grandkids too much, playing taxi, caring for aging parents, pressure to volunteer for things all the time, et cetera. Well, Part of, part of that is uh, comes in with your happiness portfolio, because if you figure, let's just take the, the volunteer thing. And yes, is it, is it reality that people are going to ask you to volunteer a lot? Yes, but it's about boundaries. And if you say, OK, look, I've got all these other things in my life I want to do, and I'm going to I'm going to allocate three hours a week for volunteering. When you fill up your three hours, you your answer to the next request is, I'm sorry, I, I, I just don't have time. 
to the other one, and it's a, it's a very real issue, that of the expectations, for example, of your children for babysitting. One client came in one time and she had, she had reached, she was a, she was a solo agent and she was really excited about retiring. And she knew that she wanted to spend more time with her grandchildren, but she came in, she was very upset because it turned out that her daughter's interpretation of spending more time with your grandchildren translated into being the full-time nanny. Her expectation was, I'm going to babysit a little bit more, but maybe it's one afternoon a week, but they haven't talked about it. So the important thing for managing whether you're a, you know, the taxi driver or whether you're the, the full-time babysitter goes in the assumptions and the conversations that you have with the people that are important in your life about what you want this time of your life to be like and how you want to play um, what part you want to play in some of those activities that they want you to share in. But it's so it's, it, it's managing those expectations. Right. And I, I suspect sometimes you don't, you, it's hard to think about all those things in advance, but to address it as soon as it starts to become an issue and talk. Absolutely. About it yeah, absolutely. But again, if you have a happiness portfolio, your happiness portfolio thought through, if you've taken the time to, you know, to think about what you want, um, then it's it, it might spark you to have that conversation before it even becomes an issue. But you're absolutely right, Jessica. Uh, as soon as it even begins to bubble to the surface, it's, that's the time to address it before it becomes an issue. Yeah. Uh, in your experience, how does continuing to work part time or casually affect retirees? It, it, again, it depends on the person. Everybody, you know, we're all you know we're all unique, and therefore our journey looks a little bit different. For, for some of us, and I'm certainly a, you know, an example of that, I've been retired for over 11 years, having this engagement in my life is, is my purpose. I mean, it truly is my purpose to help people have a successful transition into retirement and really thrive in that time of their life. Am I working at the same level as I did before, the same number of hours with the same stress? No, I'm not. And so therefore I'm free to do a lot of things that I never had time to do, but that's my choice. And that's what happens with a lot of people that choose to work. But again, it's a boundary issue. You, you, you know, you have to make the decision of how much time you want to put into that, you know, whatever that activity is that you're getting paid for. It's your choice. All right. Um, so you mentioned of getting involved in activities that build self-worth. So that, I feel like it's maybe sometimes hard to pinpoint what those activities might be. Some people have already built them into their lives, but for those who haven't, can you give some examples of activities that build self-worth that you can do in retirement? Sure. Well, one of them is, it re translates back to what you think your sense of purpose is. And I really didn't talk much about purpose tonight, although I mean, I've done many, 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 many seminars on, on, on purpose. And from that, I know that we as human beings are hardwired to have a need to feel like we matter. And that sense of purpose is part of it. So it's very important to me, for the, to everybody that I work with, that you have a sense of what that looks like. And it's gonna be different for everyone, absolutely different for everyone. But when you have that sense of purpose, you, you, know, you, you don't tend to feel like you're wasting your time. You, don't, you, you have that, that sense of self-worth because you know you're making a contribution. Mm -hmm. um, and, how, and how you make that contribution is different for every one of it, but it clearly feeds your sense of self-worth. Okay, great. Um, and I'll just check with Jane. She's kind of monitoring things here. Jane, am I missing any questions? She doesn't know. <laughs> uh, well, it wouldn't let me unmute. No, we are good to go. Okay, awesome. Well, Marianne, thank you so much for being here today and sharing this with us. I hope everyone on the webinar found the content to be really valuable as you navigate and plan for your own retirement. Uh, we are big fans here of planning for things. Um, as you said, Marianne, things usually don't happen by accident. You got to think it through in advance and make sure that what you want is what's going to happen. 
So I think it's really valuable. Retirement is a journey. Like all journeys, proper planning is paramount to success. These life journeys are different for everyone, as you've said multiple times tonight. I hope the webinars provided some perspective on the importance of focusing on more than just the dollars and cents of retirement. We're going to post this webinar online, and it will take us a few days to get that posted. So within the next week, you should get an email uh, with the link to the webinar video. So if you want to watch this again or just go back to key points that you missed a little bit of, then you'll be able to do that. And you can also feel free to share that link with friends and family that you think would appreciate the content of the webinar today. If you would like more information about non-financial retirement planning, you are welcome to reach out to Marianne and her partner, Susan, at nextchapterlifestyleadvisors.com, and they provide services there. Um, we also have some options for you here. In the next day or two, you will get an email from us following up from this webinar that describes some of those um, things that you'll have coming from us or opportunities that you have um, that we can help with. So one, we will have in that email the contact information for Marianne Suzanne, so you can do that. We're also going to be sending everyone a giveaway guide for this webinar called Transitions, Thriving in the Midst of Change. So we know there's so much change that happens when you retire. It's not just one thing, it's everything. So um, that should be a useful tool as you're preparing for retirement or when, if you're there already. Um, information about some other resources that we're offering will also be in that email. We do have 30 minute Ask a Retirement Coach sessions that we can uh, offer to you with Marianne or Susan and just reach out to us and we can set, help that get set up for you. So you get to sit down with Marianne for 30 minutes and talk about your specific retirement issues and, and what you wanna see happen there. We also, um, if you aren't already getting financial planning advice, so if you're not an existing client and you're trying to plan for the financial side of your retirement, we do offer complimentary retirement savings planning and retirement income planning consultations. So you can reach out to us and we can set that up just to get you started with that financial planning for your retirement as well. And I'm also really excited to announce, this is the first official announcement that I'm gonna be starting a monthly lunchtime webinar called Ask an Advisor. It will be happening at noon on the third th Tuesday of each month. There'll be a five to 10 minute uh, educational piece followed by an open Q&A time. So you can ask whatever questions you have. The first Ask an Advisor webinar is happening on June 20th. And the topic of that week's webinar will be five ways to protect your retirement income. The registration link for that will be in the follow-up email as well. So if that's something that interests you, you can go to the email to register. And if you have any other questions after this webinar, please do reach out to us. We're happy to help in any way we can. I wanna thank everyone for attending tonight and hopefully you found it very useful. And this is the end of this webinar. So everyone have a wonderful evening.